Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's a enormous episode 49. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man in Brooklyn, Mr. Chad Owen. Good evening. Good morning, Sydney. Hello, Brooklyn, and uh, we have charged, charged into the world of architecture. We started with two heavyweights in the first of our series, Chad. How are you feeling post Norman Foster and Frank Geary, are you, are you ready for another one? Yeah, pretty good. You know, we we started with kind of the two greats in in modernist architecture, and we're going to go back a little bit in time to someone that kind of chafed at uh, the idea of modernism. But you know, he's he's no less uh, inf- influential. Some might say even more influential than uh, than you know the contemporaries of, of Frank Gehry and. In Norman Foster, and of, of course, that could only mean that we're visiting uh, the life and works of Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, I mean, this Frank Lloyd Wright, he is he is a titan. If you remember our author series, Chad, do you remember how we were talking about Peter Drucker being kind of the titan of our author series? I, I would have to say, I think Frank Lloyd Wright is the powerhouse of this series don't you i mean he he actually architected over a thousand structures over 532 of those were built and he has produced a number not just one but i think he's produced a number of buildings that easily on any good architects list would be top 10 ever constructed buildings wouldn't you say yeah certainly most recognizable uh, to, I think, the largest audiences. You know, certainly the mm-hmm. Guggenheim Museum here in New York City comes to mind um, as as a quite unforgettable uh, building. And even if you don't know kind of what it's called or, or where it is, you certainly have have seen it before at some point in, 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 in popular culture. And yeah, I think when it comes to m- most well-known architects, he's he's certainly right up there. And, you know, his buildings are interestingly not in most of them aren't in the you know densely packed urban uh, metropolises of of the world he he built uh many of them in the midwest and right. in in the west you know away from urban centers because he 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 kind of chafed against uh the urbanization of the world but you know i've been fortunate enough to visit uh some of his buildings in, in the midwest as as i was going to school there and i discovered many many more uh, in, mm. in research for the show that I, I would love to go and visit in person as well. It's Isn't it fascinating? He, you mentioned what they call his prairie style. Um, and that really spoke to this very organic nature by like his style and aesthetic was very organic. So we really encourage our listeners to go and Google and YouTube around because there are some amazing documentaries. I'll put a few of them in the show notes. Um, his design, his vision was so organic. His his prairie and uh, rural buildings almost blend in, and they're almost disguised into. They feel like a natural part of the environment. And what was crazy, Chad, is he came to New York and then he pulled off the Guggenheim, which mm-hmm. equally has this organic nature to it, but feels so appropriate in an urban city. Yeah, and it, it's. It's uh, its uniqueness has has remained to this day. You know, unfortunately, several of his buildings had either weren't built or or you know ones like the Imperial Hotel in, in Tokyo were demolished. I mean, that was after it had survived an earthquake when all the other buildings in Tokyo did not, which is kind huh. of a testament to his his skill as an engineer, which is um, what he actually went to school for and didn't finish um, because he wanted to be an architect so much. So he actually for didn't get his architecture or didn't hit, get his engineering uh, certif- certificate and instead pursued architecture oh, wow. right away. So that's, hang on, Chad, you, you're saying his, his building in Tokyo managed to survive the earthquake when literally everything around it fell down? Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he, what building was it called? Do you remember? The Imperial Hotel. Okay. Imperial Hotel. Yeah. If, 
he was very interested in, you know, we'll, 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 we'll hear from him and others. He, he was very interested in the newer construction materials that were available to him at, at the time, you know, in many ways, kind of a foreshadowing of uh, Norman Foster and his interest in, in the science and engineering of the materials that he's using. But Frank Lloyd Wright constructed the building in a way that was much more kind of interconnected and where many of the forces in tensions in the building were s- spread out in a way so that there wasn't kind of like a central break point. Exactly. Um, yeah. it, it wasn't engineered, you know, entirely to resist earthquakes, although that was, that was partly it, but it was just, um, the way he thought of the interconnectedness of the materials and using steel and concrete in, in new ways was one of the, the things that helps that building, uh, survive the earthquake. I think it was in like 30, 1936 or 37. Right, right. And look, for those of you who who have a little bit of a taste for architecture, you will probably know uh, his most, probably, well, it's hard to know, one of his signature buildings, which is called Falling Water, which is out in Pennsylvania. And that, it speaks a lot to his ability to make it so organic that you almost feel like the house is a natural part of the environment. But I would love to share one last thing, Chad, uh, before we we jump into some of the clips, which was in preparing for this show, we both found this SC Johnson building uh, that he built, and I had no idea that this uh, building existed. And look, if anyone is is listening to this and they're on their phone or at their laptop, just Google the Johnson building, and you will see one of the most remarkable buildings. And we're actually going to talk about it later in the show, but just to, for all the boffins out there, just check out the Johnson Building by Frank Lloyd Wright. It is one of the most stunning interiors you'll ever, 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 ever see. And very, very special, isn't it, Chad? Yeah. Yeah. And one point to make too is, you know, we're kind of separating Frank Lloyd Wright's personal life from his professional life. And I know that, you know, there's some, some issues with that, but, um, you know, he certainly, he had many wives, many children, uh, many, many lovers, um, you know, it was probably would, would not survive, uh, in today's me too age. But, um, uh, there was also some personal tragedies, you know, where his family was burned and murdered by, uh, a slighted, um, employee, but, uh, you know, so if, if his uh, great achievements in the world of architecture weren't enough, you know, his, his personal life was certainly also just as fascinating and, and interesting as well. Yeah, yeah. So let's celebrate the work of uh, of a truly great architect. Chad, I, I'm itching. Why don't you launch us into our, our first clip? What do we got? Mr. Wright, your phrase organic architecture has become a part of the language by now, even if it isn't yet really comprehended. You've often called it a natural architecture, an architecture of integrity. Could you define it further? Well, that word integrity you've just used <clears throat> is what is lacking in almost all art, artistic expression or expression of the arts today. And integrity would imply natural, would imply nature in a, in a profound sense. And when you proceed from generals to particulars, as you do when you are building, that's your natural gut. Natural center line of your effort would be the what is the natural thing? What is the nature of your materials? Even the nature of your client? The nature of the situation on which the house is built? The nature of the climate? It's all a nature study, the building of a house. Well, th- this is really interesting to me, Chad, because this is all about this very strong concept, a strong idea that architects need to have like a signature uh, style or aesthetic as to how they see ha- houses. And, you know, you saw what, what, what was so great about uh, hearing Frank Lloyd Wright then is he was really explaining what is commonly referred to is his organic signature style. And for me, what I take out of this, Chad, is the enormous importance for architects to have a point of view about the operating system of a house, how it should look, feel, and work. But what I 
also take out of it as an entrepreneur and someone who builds things in the digital world is by having these points of views, it becomes a way for us to relate and bounce off different ideas in the world. And just like great sporting teams have a signature style um, and great business people lead in particular ways, I think knowing what you're about, knowing your style, your method is a really big learning here because when you hear him talk about it, Frank obviously has a very clear system in his mind of what he works with, the factors, the environment, the landscape, the context by which he builds. And that to me is the big lesson in that clip. Yeah, I'm actually taking something a bit different in, I hear a lot of Elon Musk's idea to go back to first principles when Frank talks about the nature of things. I I hear him kind of trying to get at the true nature of the client or the materials or the building site. Yes. And so that true, true, that kind of um, like really inquiring into and digging deep to find out, you know, what really is steel so that he can use it like in a completely new and different and untried way. So if you, if you ever, if you're ever on the site of one of his buildings, sometimes it can seem a little, Maybe I'll just say a bit underwhelming at first in kind of its simplicity. You're like, oh, well, like this is all it is. But then when you see, when you get closer and you experience the the space, you can understand how he takes the really simple things and uses them in completely new ways. So as I'm trying to take a lesson away from this, it's like going to the simplest building blocks can actually be better for for trying to create and build new things than like making something really complicated. Yes, yeah. So in, in a certain way, he has that um, parallel that's analogous with uh, Steve Jobs going right to the essential. Mm-hmm. Steve Jobs always talked about the hardest decision is what to take out of the phone, what to take out of the PC, the laptop. And in a way, you know, Lloyd Wright is challenging us to go to the essential nature of things and don't overcomplicate them. And if you look at his buildings, you can just see this come alive. He, you can see his view around this organic, uh, nature, nature-driven architecture. You can just see, you just need to look at the Guggenheim in New York, falling water, or the Johnson building, and you just go, ah, I get it. Yeah. And and all the buildings sit so interestingly into the landscape and almost disappear uh, in some ways. You know, his his home or his primary residence, Taliesin in, in central Wisconsin, you, you know, it's a very hilly landscape and he, he specifically didn't build it on top of the hill. That's what everyone does at first. You know, they get they buy a piece of land and they put the building at the top of the hill. But he purposely didn't do that because it's not sitting with or being at one with with the site and and with nature. And so he creates a much more integrated experience between the landscape and the built environment b- because he's making those kinds of choices. Yeah. There's 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 so there's so many completely new and pardon the word innovative things that Frank Lloyd Wright really brought into the language of of architecture. You know, there's almost too many to to list, but we have a uh, we have a great little clip here where he's kind of listing off some of them, and so things that we we take for granted today when it comes to not like architecture, you know, capital A architecture, but just the way buildings are built today, really had their roots in in the work that he and 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 his apprentices and others were doing at his studio in in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Would you recount for some of the things? which are fundamentally your own innovations in architecture. Well, it would be pretty difficult and be a long story too, perhaps too long for this. First of all came this uh, new sense of space as the reality of the building. Then came the countenance of that space, which was more or less what I termed streamlined. Then there was the open plan Instead of a building being a series of boxes and closets, became more and more open, more and more uh, sense of space. The outside came in more and more, and the inside went out more. That went along until we had a, a practically a new floor plan, and it's been referred to always as the open plan. That was the direct result. 
Oh, and I think the corner window is something we should mention in connection with innovation. The corner window was indicative of an idea conceived early in my work that the box was a fascist symbol and of the architecture of freedom and democracy needed something beside the box. So I started out to destroy the box as a building. Well, uh, the corner window came in as the uh, comp all the comprehension that ever was given to that act of the destruction of the box. The light came in where it had never come before. Vision went out, and you had screens instead of walls. Here the walls vanished as walls, and the box vanished as a box. And the corner window went around the world, but the idea of the thing never followed it. And it became merely a window instead of the release of an entire uh, sense of structure. Oh, gee, I love that, Chad. What a great clip. I mean, he basically challenged the concept of why are, why are we making all the houses into boxes? Why don't we open them up? Why don't we let the light in? Why don't we create space within them? Now, I, I just want to like help everyone a little bit here that might seem more self-obvious in today's age, but he was literally doing this 50, 60 years ago when the default he was the doing it a hundred years standard. ago, Mike. Yeah, he built <laughs> Taliesin right. his his, his, his residence like in 1907 or 1909. And you know it, the cool thing is, um, I think that has now become the Frank Lloyd Wright School, where architects to this day study. Yes, which is very cool. Yeah, but I, I do want to mention that he was extremely exploitative um, of the apprentices that worked in his school. They actually paid him. To be indentured servants in his studio, the uh, the working conditions were not uh, not too too good. But that was that was kind of part of his uh, egotist, uh, larger than life uh, per personality. <laughs> oh, Chad, Chad, you want to talk about egotist? Did you hear how he started that off? He's like, now if you want me to talk about my innovations, we might be here for a very long time. <laughs> I mean, like, come on! But let's give this guy benefit of the doubt. It's a long time ago, and we're not here to judge the man, but to judge his work and how he did it. I love this idea of you. We were we were talking earlier about getting back to essential thinking. I mean, he went right back and said, like a house should not be a box, and having the confidence to go about that and sustain that vision in over five hundred completed buildings is a testament to him. And it shows us all that to do great things often takes the courage to solve big problems and to do them. And I think the emphasis here in radical ways. Yeah. And, you know, many of the, I don't want to downplay many of the accomplishments of, you know, the more tech focused uh, people that we profiled on the, on the show, but it, it's mostly, you know, lines of code and networking and, 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 and that sort of thing. He's, he's working with actual you know, building materials and people are living and working in these structures. So it, I think it's, it's a much more, or it was a much more daunting task for him to completely reinvent these things. As you're mentioning the, the Johnson wax building, there was no need for illuminate, you know, artificial illumination because of the way he completely opened up the workspace and let in natural light with this really interesting kind of like lily pad, uh, looking, ceiling that just lets in all of the natural light. And you look at that photo today and you think, well, yeah, I've yeah. seen those open floor plans like all over the place, but he was doing it <laughs> way before anyone else with very real structural and engineering limitations. So for me, the really interesting part is how he was able to overcome and work through that despite those very real like physical limitations. Right. So so for me, I'm, I'm just like, I'm taking away these concepts that we can see in the Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, story. We see resilience. We see the confidence, the daring, the courage to be so different. And this is what has given him the, the capacity to go right to the essential organic nature of things. And he, he rethought architecture from that point. But I think it's safe to say, Chad, he had some pretty serious points of views, not only about architects and, and so forth, 
but also about engineers, wouldn't you say? No, Frank Lloyd Wright doesn't hold back on any of his opinions on 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 anyone. But yeah, here's a here's a great clip we have of him talking specifically about intellectuals. Well, about how many uh, companion students do you have? There are about sixty now. They come from all over the world. Do they? Some of them have training. Uh, well, some have training, and have to. But it doesn't matter it. if they don't. And some don't have training and are quite ready to develop. Without it. Well, now, what's the minimum thing? that They surely have to know some engineering. Am I right? No, because an engineer is only a rudimentary, undeveloped architect. Oh, they dear. have to get the sense of the thing, the sense of structure, the sense of materials. They have to get the nature of the thing, which very few engineers know. The and engineer the nature is of the a bookman, as a rule. He gets everything out of books and formulas and puts things together, takes them apart, without ever knowing... Well, you know these characters who know all about everything and understand nothing. And you can say that of an engineer where architecture is concerned. Well, where do you he think they should... He knows all about the architecture and knows nothing about it. Where do you think they should get their roots from, from the, the nature, terrain? The... Nature study, not necessarily terrain. Nature with a capital N, the nature of this hand, what is it? The nature of the nail on the thumb, whatever is this. What's the nature of this? You learn what it'll do. What uh, is Brett What is the nature of this little thing here? Well, what is it? Isn't that cute? What's the nature of that? That's nature in that sense that he studies. And from that, he develops by way of experience, trying this, trying that, seeing it tried. In building. Out of our failures at Taliesin, when we make a... When we make a bad thing and have to take it down or do it over, he learns. And he learns more, as I have done in my lifetime, more from my mistakes than I ever learned from, from my success. And from a professor. Well, I don't know There's one. why professors are any more than I know why a profession is. There's one thing here. It says, then, this is the 11th piece of advice, go as far away as possible from home to rebuild your first buildings. The physician can bury his mistakes but the architect can, can only advise his client to plant vines. Is have you ever... True? It's true, but have you ever advised any clients I to plant vines? I feel that now about some of the things that I did early in my life. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure th- everyone does. We'll leave your such clients nameless. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. I think I'd prefer to leave them <laughs> <laughs> What... I mean, did you just get transported back in history? I mean, you can, you know, through that crackle, crackle, you can hear, you can visualize the black and white conversation that was going on. Uh, Was this the smoke-filled conversation, Chad? No, I think this is a different interview he did in the late, in the late fifties, but they're very lit, funny. You know, there's the kind of uh, stilted uh, studio-like environment. You know, Frank is kind of sitting with like his scarf and uh, coat still on. He's holding a big giant sketch pad. Yeah, <laughs> clearly, cl- clearly a figure here. But the takeaway f- for me is he's talking about learning and learning from failure. Which how how good was that? Yeah, which is really interesting to me because again, like if you mess up a building you have to tear it down. It's not like you can just like go back to the source code and like change a few lines of code. It's like, no, sometimes you have to, you know, completely knock it down and start over again, which I think is really, really interesting. And even, you know, a profession that ostensibly has, you know, so much art and and creativity in it, you know, there's still a really important factor of try something out and learn from your mistakes. And and what is so great is that, the argument for prototyping and to always be learning, which are two massive themes we've discovered, Chad, we're seeing architects from the early 1900s essentially employing what we might call rapid prototyping. A very much Frank Lloyd Wright is all about design thinking, empathy for the workers in the building, for the people living in a building. This to me is just a, a, an enormous tick of approval to the idea of always be learning, to be iterative in your process, to ask yourself what went wrong and why and how can we make it better. I mean, he's the very definition of some of the best practices of today's world of creation, of design and architecture. Mm-hmm. I think this is so exciting to discover. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, again, I don't know why I'm so 
uh, surprised when we're going as far afield as investors and architects and the things that people like you and I that are building, you know, innovative digital products. Uh, <laughs> there's there's so much to learn uh, in fields that uh, are maybe quite far afield from uh, from what we're doing. And you know, hope, hopefully, all of of the listeners are, are getting just as as much from it as you and I are. I want to remind everyone that. All of the the clips that we're talking about here and, and links to all of the the buildings and feel free to do your own Google image search searches, but everything will be collected on on the show notes for this show at moonshots.io. So now that we've we've kind of discovered how to go to the essence of something, how to unpack it and redefine it and to always be learning, which are the first few ideas that Frank Lloyd Wright has given us. Let's really indulge ourselves now to understand exactly what he did, because um, at the heart of, of, of the the things we just learned uh, was one building that that stands incredibly tall and is so prominent in New York, and that's obviously as we've mentioned, the Guggenheim Museum. So uh, we're now going to go into a into a series of clips and a deep dive, Chad. Let's go. Let's let's get our our minds acquainted with just how significant this building was when it was first introduced into New York. So here's the the setup to the story of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. New York as the capital of the political and cultural world of the third quarter of the 20th century, that you have a series of buildings, starting with the Museum of Modern Art, which is the first museum built exclusively for modern art and in the new international style. Then you have the United Nations headquarters, which established New York as the political capital of the new global world which was in part designed by Le Corbusier. Then you have the Seagram Building, which was designed by Mies van der Rohe and became the most refined and beautiful model for corporate architecture in the world. And then into this mix, right in the middle of it all, comes Frank Lloyd Wright, who is completely outside this mainstream of established modern architects, who gets the chance to build in New York his dream building, which he then takes and runs with. And he builds a building in the city he supposedly despised for a kind of program which he supposedly despised, meaning New York and modern art, and makes a building that becomes the building that people come to visit New York for and to see modern art in. What a guy. What a building. The ironies of life. (laughs) Chad, is that not the most New York clip we've ever had on the show? <laughs> yeah. We just need uh, some honking and some sirens in the background. I think that would <laughs> flesh it out. <laughs> but, you know, as you as you realize, he, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was almost contrarian to, to a lot of New York at the time, but he came along in with one building has made – such a mark. I mean, what an incredible legacy to have on, you know, the city that is obviously the center of the universe. Yeah. The interesting thing to me is the context in which he sets Frank Lloyd Wright building the Guggenheim, uh, you know, among some contemporaries of his whose style was very different and very at home in an urban environment like New York City, which he had shunned for most of his professional career. Yeah, yeah, and we've got some more uh, m- more inspiration around the Guggenheim Museum. Uh, let's just jump straight into this second clip, which takes us inside the building. The Guggenheim is one of New York City's most iconic and beloved buildings. Every day at the Guggenheim, there are several thousand visitors who go in and out our Frank Lloyd Wright design doors. Frank Lloyd Wright had a lot of passion about this museum. It was going to be a really great opportunity for him to integrate his ideas about organic architecture, you know, which you see in this sort of nice, easy, upward spiral of the ramp. And with that passion for the museum, uh, you know, over the 16 years it takes to be built, uh, opening in October of 1959, he was a real champion for it. 
Even though Wright didn't like being in cities, he played with it in quite a nice way and he refers to the building as a continuation of the street grid, but then going up into this spiral. The shape and the structure of the building are incredibly important for all of our shows. What we have done over the years is always try to fit our shows to the building. So what you see is a building that is slowly moving out from its core downstairs. One of the great things about our building is, and you see that here behind me, is that you have the ramps stacked on top of each other. And what we can easily do is make a relationship between the works that we're showing. Where often when you go to a museum it's a very uh, individual experience. What you get here is also an experience of seeing and being seen and doing that constantly while you're walking around uh, the ramps. The Guggenheim engages with the New York City community in various ways. Um, we're first and foremost, of course, a cultural institution. But then on top of that, we're an edu educational institution. Right? What else do you guys notice when you walked in here? What really impressed you? It looks like a big swirl. I heard you say an action word that I think is really great to start us off with. Swirl. So can everybody put their finger up and show me the swirl of the building? Learning Through Art is a residency program. We go into public schools in all five boroughs of New York City and we do a curriculum integrated art project with a kid that spans 20 weeks of the school year. The first time they walk through the door and see the building for the first time, the sense of discovery on their faces is amazing. We are constantly restoring and renovating the building and one of our current restoration needs are the doors downstairs, the doors that have 1.3 million visitors coming through them every year. This is a huge number, uh, which means that those doors are deteriorating and they're deteriorating rapidly. Um, so if we don't restore these doors now, they will be lost for the future. Partners in Preservation is a wonderful opportunity for the Guggenheim to restore our Frank Lloyd Wright design doors. Our doors are where several thousand visitors enter and exit each day. It's a portal to the wonderful experience within our city, state, and national landmark. Don't you just listen to that and you think to yourself, oh my gosh, how permanent like analog architecture truly is when compared with all the digital stuff that we, we interact with and forget so quickly, Jed? Yeah, I think it's part of the experiential nature of the built environment that architects work in. It's just so much more visceral. So whereas you can kind of try to create some excitement or movement in digital products, the layout and program of the Guggenheim forces you to experience the 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 spiral or the the swirl as the little girl mm. was mm. was mentioning there in in real time and in the real space, which I think is much of the magic of of architecture as compared to as you're saying more uh more software or, yeah. or digital based products yeah and and what we heard then i mean there was lots of good stuff it's so wonderful that kids get the chance to go in and experience the building but imagine that the, i mean when i think about this legacy 1.3 million people every year walk into a, a space that frank lloyd wright built and their first reaction is just going to be wow how cool is this? And I think that is exceptionally cool and, and just such a great way to capture the significance of Frank Lloyd Wright. And I, I really want to come back and, and, and just point out that those lessons we learned at the front of the show really helped Lloyd Wright create the Guggenheim and many other places. So this search for the es essential nature of things to to re to question the box and turn houses into these open light livable places and that through every single project every year he was always learning and iterating in the search uh, for the essential nature of things and I, I think what we heard there was just the sheer magic that that you can see that those very things uh, that he did created the magic and and i would say for me it's a reinforcement that if i want to achieve such things then then i have to pursue the, the essential nature of things i have to ask big questions solve them in radical ways and to always be learning so I, i'm married to an architect and uh i'm still learning so many things that i didn't know about frank lloyd wright um you know i went to school in chicago and and that's kind of where he got started in the western suburbs and I believe it's Oak Park and, you know, had had a chance to visit the Roby House on the University of Chicago campus. But um, 
digging deep and doing this research and, and finding some really interesting interviews and clips has made me appreciate Frank Lloyd Wright even more for not just his buildings, but his kind of philosophy and how he thought about and created those buildings. And, you know, uh, his kind of broader learnings that he's sharing with us, whether that's about how or- organic architecture for him is, it's a bit like a religion. He he talks about, or he's been asked, you know, so what's your religion or what's your religious affiliation? And he says nature with a capital N, which isn't just kind of the outdoor nature, but it's also getting at the nature of things as, as we we're saying, you know, going back to first principles. So it's it's been really interesting and fascinating uh, to learn all of these new things about Frank Lloyd Wright. But we're not done. We still have four really great <laughs> clips here uh, in the second half of this show to uh, to share with all of our listeners. Well, uh, you know, I'm with you, Chad. Like, this is this is like so wonderful on so many levels because you, we, we're actually we're looking at what he does and how he does it. And I think these philosophies that we have coming up, this is really the why. Mm-hmm. This is the the. the it's going to be a little heady. I think we should probably give everyone a heads up that this stuff is going to be uh, some pretty thought provoking, maybe even a little bit abstract at times. But we really feel lucky that we have the chance to understand the ideas and the thinking at the heart of Frank Lloyd Wright's success. So, where should we kick this off, Chad Owen? We'll start with the first of these philosophical sharings from from Frank, and he's going to draw a line from good architecture to actually return on investment. And there's some really interesting parallels to uh, to what companies are doing today to take advantage of well built company headquarters. What do you consider are the most important factors in in this case, building of a factory? Well, I think the human values involved. I think the lives of the workers. I don't see why it isn't a more profitable thing to make those lives happy. They'll be more productive. And environment, as we found it to be when we built the Johnson Building, results in a greatly increased efficiency on their part. If you make them proud of their environment and happy to be where they are, and give them some dignity and pride in their environment. It all comes out to the good where the product is concerned. The Johnson people have a profit-sharing system with their employees. And when they got into that building, why, one of the first consequences was tea in the afternoon. And they didn't like to go home. They loved to stay in the building, be there, come early enjoy it as charming features of a very interesting, exciting environment. And it is profitable, it does. Uh, I think the phrase is payoff, isn't it, in our country? A healthful environment in which the workers can take pride pays off. Now, Chad, if you heard uh, an architect today talking like that, that wouldn't be that surprising, but I'm going to guess that clip is at least 40 to 50 years of age. And how how important it is to to establish that this was revolutionary thinking in the industrial age. This was quite a watershed, wasn't it, Chad? Yeah, it was, this was six, 60 years ago. This was 1956, 1957. The the building he's talking about is the Johnson Building that you and I were talking about. This big open plan with the with the amazing uh, ceiling that just lets all this light in. And this, to me, sounds very much like what companies like Google and Facebook are doing to keep all of their employees in the building as much as possible, right. so that they can get as much productivity out of them. I think Frank Lloyd Wright might be a bit uh, distressed at kind of the perversion of that, used as maybe a Entrapment. A, an entra- yeah, exactly. A purely profit seeking, <laughs> yeah. purely profit seeking motive. But it's interesting how, how he was able to back then really draw that line between and really push the value of architecture to corporations. It's not just a place to house the factories and a place to house the people. But I think to him, he really saw it as an enriching place or, or he saw the potential for it to be an enriching place 
for the individuals. And then a kind mm. of happy byproduct of that is, is increased productivity and, you know, higher profits, et cetera. Yeah. And, and this, the scale of his thinking, whether the detail he put into the engineering plans, the thought he put into spaces or these ideas of healthy, natural spaces for healthy, thriving employees, he's, his thinking was very expansive. You know, we hear, he's very analogous to Musk. Musk can talk in infinite detail about a use case or he can really challenge first principles. Actually, I think, I think Lloyd Wright is quite similar in that way. And for all of this mental robustness, like he, he's a well thought gentleman. What's really interesting is even though he's obviously pretty, uh, happy with himself, there is this pragmatic, uh, nature to him. So let's have a listen to this next clip because this is him responding in an interview to the idea that he's an intellectual. And this is a very interesting twist on Frank Lloyd Wright. Let's have a listen. All right, let me ask you this. As an intellectual yourself, Mr. Wright, what do you think of President... I the allegation and I refuse to marry that girl. <laughs> What do you think of... I don't like intellectuals. You don't like intellectuals? Why not? Because they're superficial. They're up top. They're from the top down, not from the ground up. I've always flattered myself that what I represented was from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Does that mean anything? I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> from the ground up, Chad. From the ground up. Yeah, to, to me, he's talking about a user-centered, user-obsessed approach. Mm. Uh, you know, I hear maybe a bit of Jeff Bezos in that, in that Frank Lloyd Wright, I, whether he truly lived this, or maybe there's a bit of, uh, I don't know, paradox or hypocrisy in this. Like, I, I think he was very concerned with what his clients needs and wants were S stated needs and wants, and then observed needs and wants. Cause I think that's also very important. He would often go in and observe the or, or ask about, you know, the, the daily rituals and, and comings and goings of his clients so that he could understand how to put that into, into the built environment in the spaces that he's building. But I, I love his, his attention and focus on the users, uh, mm. or, you know, the grassroots from the ground up, uh, perspective, as opposed to many of his contemporaries, which still said, no, this is what a building is. This is what it should do kind of irrespective of uh, where it is or who's going to be using it. Yeah, and, th and that really dovetails into what you and I work on today is we think about the world very much bottom up. We try not to be that classic MBA kind of business plan, let's write a big, massive business plan kind of approach. We're all about creating business value, but, but doing so... Uh, bottom up, starting with the user, the customer, solving problems that they have, finding economic value in the exchange of this product or service, and, uh, you know, approaching this in a way that is all about working with good people on good projects. And this is really contrarian to industrial age MBA classic thinking. And what's so awesome is Frank Lloyd Wright was advocating this approach in 1957. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's also hitting home this idea of nature. You know, what is, what is the true nature of this thing? And the nature of it can only come from the thing or the object or the person. Uh, it can't be in a way like there's not an, a platonic ideal or something that's, you know, delivered from the mountaintop. It's like, you just have to go and sit with the thing to understand what it is. And so I, I love that kind of immediacy and kind of physicality of of that idea. I, I can just like imagine him getting his hands dirty, you know, in a very real, real way to figure out yeah. uh, what the nature of these, these things are. And then when I put that next to the scale of his achievements, Taliesin, uh, Falling Water, Guggenheim, this is the ultimate proof of asking daring questions, being a lifelong learner, prototyping, thinking iteratively, uh, using empathy around the people that are going to use a space or a product or a service. This is the ultimate proof point. Like you need go no further 
uh, than looking at what he's achieved. This is a validation of those practices, don't you think, Chad? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not sure, is Frank Lloyd Wright the furthest back that we've gone in terms of, I mean, oh, I guess yeah. maybe only like P- Peter Drucker a bit, but he was not quite as early as Frank Lloyd Wright. I- I'm just really surprised at the contemporariness of uh, both of the of gentlemen. His- yeah. Drucker and, and, and right? Like yeah. they both if you just get past the fact I don't know that, what that says about us though. It's like it's like we almost <laughs> haven't learned the lessons 60 years on. Well, well don't it, there is the saying that there's no such thing as a new idea. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. See, we warned the audience this was going to get a little heady. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go yeah. up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think I mean, we, I think we started out almost with my, I think we're going to start and end with my favorite clips. Um, we've, we've got one more before the end, but th- this idea of going back to nature and, and first principles is really fascinating. And I think it's something that all of us can uh, refocus on and turn our attention to as we're, we're taking these yeah. lessons away from, from totally. frankly, right. Because we're often so distracted by all the noise on the edge that we never get to the center of things, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like there's just so much blah, blah, blah. And you're like, can we get back to first principles, please? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. yeah, Or or, or don't over explain or educate it. He has, we have a clip here that's a very interesting uh, juxtaposition between what, what Frank Lloyd Wright calls education and what he thinks of as true culture and how we may think that one can lead to the other, but um, it's, in his, in his eyes, it's uh, not quite that simple. You see, you're only human as you rise above the animal. Your animal self is one fundamental factor or element in your life. Then when you come into the higher things that are not animal, the things of the spirit, then you get into this realm that we call art, and you begin to look for things that are creative rather than just uh, repetitive. And I think there's where you're in the realm of culture rather than education, because you can educate an animal. You've seen them do tricks, haven't you? Well, I think that's a pretty good uh, contra- uh, definition of the difference between education and culture. So you can see how the trampling of the herd would have a small chance to develop culture of an individual. It's got to be an individual affair. It's got to be a slow f- affair. It's got to be a peculiar to you affair. Now, how are you going to do it with 20,000 students in a university? How are you going to do it with high schools crammed two stories, three stories high with a crowd of students? As a matter of fact, culture is not for the herd. Culture is not for the crowd. Culture is an individual thing. Hmm. Culture versus education and culture of oneself and rising above. Oh, my gosh. Uh, This is a little dangerous, this idea. Where do you want to take this one, Chad? (laughs) Yeah, well, I think for me it was important. Obviously, this has very close ties to Ayn Rand and objectivism, you know, which may be anathema to some, controversial to others, or gospel uh, to some of our listeners. I, I don't know where you fall on that spectrum, but I think his his observations are interesting in that he sees, and again, I don't see it as kind of an either or or, or, a, or a right or a wrong, but I think often what, what is lost in discussions of culture today when it comes to building great cultures inside of organizations, many times I think there's too much focus on everyone and kind of creating a homogenous, like a dictated homogenous culture. When actually, I think what, what I hear uh, Frank Lloyd Wright saying is that it's actually the, the development of culture inside of the individuals that could then create like a thriving, a, a thriving uh, m- multiplicity and diverse culture. So uh, I am interpreting it as Frank Lloyd Wright saying, cultivating div- you know, individual, diverse individuals can create a fantastic culture, whereas just simply educating or teaching skills to someone or teaching them 
uh, you know, tasks is never going to get you to the same level of performance or, or enrichment. Is it almost uh, analogous to the Netflix uh, philosophy of highly aligned, loosely coupled? Like, have people deeply aligned on how we want to behave as a company and then you don't have to micromanage them because they'll work it out. Is it a little bit like that? Like you think if, if people come together around culture, uh, that's the highest form that will lead more to a path of a ed- natural path of education. I see it. Netflix definitely has thought of themselves. And I, st- I think still today thinks of themselves as a very high performing professional sports team as kind of the cultural metaphor, as opposed to a family. Yes. uh, Cultural metaphor. And so I I do think Frank Lloyd Wright's kind of maybe indirectly speaking towards this kind of high, you know, team of high performers and less so the, the, the family, you know, metaphor for, for culture. But like you, you do have to be careful if you focus too much on the individual, because then it can be, the culture can become exclusionary or overlook underrepresented people. And so like, that's kind of, I think the balance that I'm personally trying to, to walk here. But I think this interesting point that he makes about the culture, it comes out of the individuals or, you know, the, the Mm. individuals contribute to the culture individually. Mm. And so if you're not developing individually, then you're not contributing to a greater culture. Got you. So just to go one step further uh, with this, now that you get to that aha moment, what would you focus on tomorrow or what would change tomorrow as a result of this little, oh. That's a tough one because lifelong learning is like a very easy kind of daily practice for me. But I think what he's asking here is like to go further. Like him saying, oh, well, you can teach animals tricks. That's education he's not wrong. So like what, how, how do you build that culture? And I think at the end of the day, for me, culture really lives in the space between people and the, and the relationships that are formed and connections. So I think maybe for me, certainly as I'm learning and growing in, in some new, uh, professional, uh, directions, I think I'm going to focus on, on the relationships Mm. and, and building those good connections that that can lead to a, a more interconnected and shared um, culture experience as as I work. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we have one last installment, Chad, as you're working on lifelong learning and your cultural contributions, because buckle in, ladies and gentlemen, we got something for you on this last clip. And uh, this is really where everything comes full circle with Frank Lloyd Wright, but I think we need to set this last clip up, Chad. So why don't you take a shot at it? Well, I found this amazing LP of all things that someone had recorded some interviews with uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright and put it on vinyl. I, I didn't find the actual uh, v- vinyl, but I found you know the the recordings online. In some ways, in 1958, he's talking about artificial intelligence. I don't know how, I don't know how he <laughs> thought of that and came up with it but he's thinking about how someone in a creative field like architecture could best use these new machines as he calls them to further their creativity and production and and, and contributions. So here's Frank Lloyd Wright on the machine age. It's taken me all these years to learn that standardization is no bar to beauty. And the standardization can be controlled and the machine used as a tool to develop a beauty greater and more beneficent, more pervading, more all-embracing than anything we ever knew before. So that's what this age means. That's what the machine age should mean. But it's being exploited and uh, turned inside out turned over wrong side up by all these opportunists and this desire for material uh, benefits and success. Same old story. There's nothing new in it. It's just as it always has been. It's only when it is conquered and we are 
we're aware of this greater and finer way of life, that we're truly Americans in the sense that we have a new country and a new ideal, and we have a new, therefore, we're bound to have a new architecture. Ooh, where do we begin on the machine age? Like, if it, it's almost as if he's talking about, it's almost as if he's alive today and talking about what he sees with artificial intelligence happening right now. But, I mean, this was obviously... Yeah, yeah, he could jump into discussions on the gig economy and AI and machine learning and we're all <laughs> going to lose our jobs. Yeah, uh, like it's all in there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What was your take out on that? Uh, yeah. I mean, aside from you could insert this into any contemporary discussions on, mm -hmm. on those topics. One thing that I don't hear a whole lot, or it's kind of maybe a niche discussion is how these sorts of technologies are going to affect the creative professions and, and just creativity in general. And can a machine be creative? Uh, can it produce art? And in this clip, he leads off with, well, in some ways we could create more beautiful things with this this standard to standardization but i think he's arguing for the creative harnessing of this power f for good i think yeah he's he not rejecting it he's by no, no means rejecting it but he, he also mentions the dark side of it in the opportunists and so for him i think it's really important to get the inputs right the inputs into the machine of course, you know, he would argue that his inputs are, are best, but he said, like, if you get the right inputs into the machine, the machine, because it's machine and it, it can do things in a standardized way and in a far more vast way, that it could be better. But the opportunists are just trying to figure out how to make the quickest buck. And so they're, you know, putting garbage in and then getting garbage out of the machines. Yeah, he was almost very essential, even in thinking about the machine age. Just like he would a house, he was able to detach any sort of, I don't know, whimsical response to it and go to the essence of it and say, well, there's good and bad. And, and the question really becomes how to get, get it working in a kind of constructive and positive manner. That, that seemed to be at the heart of his line of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think this last clip is going to be a clip that I'm going to share even, even more widely outside of this podcast, I, again, because I think it's so prescient and so interesting, his perspective, you know, knowing the time in which he lived and all of his accomplishments and, and his thoughts mm. on, uh, the, you know, the impending singularity. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what a blockbuster of a show. I mean, this has been, Chad, one of the most expansive journeys that we've been on, on these 49 shows. Frank Lloyd Wright has told us and shared with us and taught us about organic architecture, getting to the nature of things. He's challenged us to question even the box and to really go on this iterative lifelong journey of learning. Hello, does any of that sound familiar, Chad? I mean, come on. Yeah, we've, we've only recorded like 48 other episodes on the on the <laughs> that, same thing the same thing like i mean we're gonna have to go on this journey of trying to find the most obscure innovators to try and break the model but it, it the the model just keeps repeating and and i i just i really liked the fact that at the heart of the way he thought about the world it was very bottom up for someone mm -hmm. who was so super smart he still had the capacity to build a house that worked well for a family. And I think that that idea um, supports this very bottom-up approach that I think we can all walk away with a huge aha, uh -huh, like it's all bottom-up, baby. Yeah, and to overcome some of his biggest personal dislikes, like the big city and like modern art, to create arguably his most recognizable building in the Guggenheim, which was in the heart of New York City, the biggest city in the States, and to house modern mm. art, which was you know, something that he kind of uh, bumped up against, uh, you know, creatively and artistically mo throughout most of his, his career. And so for, for me, the fact that he was able to produce such an iconic building in spite of those personal uh, misgivings he might have had, again, just really speaks to his 
his professional genius and expertise when it comes to creating built environments that really yeah. work for the people, for, again, you know, the, uh, the bottom up people that are going to be using and experiencing it. Yeah, no, f- fabulous learnings and um, a real treat to to go so far back in, in our Moonshots time machine to discover uh, someone very special and, uh, you know, it's just getting ridiculous. Even uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is employing behaviors, tactics, rituals and habits that the very best of today's entrepreneurs are using as well. So, and not- yeah, and schooling us on on AI and machine learning too. <laughs> <laughs> Just while you're in, there, yeah, in the fifties. So, so what what a remarkably fun journey we've had together, Chad. And we hope you, our listeners, have enjoyed it too. But there's a few things. Number one, if you've liked anything you've heard in the show, I want to make a different call to action today. I want you to go into the iTunes store. And give us a review. We've got uh, got a few of them, um, and I would love to see some more. Um, and we're doing quite well uh, with reviews. I'm, I'm having a look here, Chad. Let's let's scroll down uh, for the listeners who have lasted this long in the show. I mean, they've got to be enjoying something here. Our our show, I think it has like ten or so. Uh, reviews, which is not too bad, but I know our listeners could do better. And tell us what you love. Uh, tell us what you'd like to hear more of. So get into your into. Your, we got an average of five stars, Chad. Uh, virtual high five. So that's great. Um, but we'd love to get say twenty reviews before the next show. So dig into your podcast app if you're on an iPhone or into Stitcher or Outcast or whatever app you're using. Um, tell us. Uh, what you think, rate the show, uh, share it with a friend. That would be huge, wouldn't it, Chad? Yeah. And uh, if you take the time to write out a review, we uh, we might even read it here on the show and give you a big shout out and thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we've mentioned quite a lot of um, secondary material, documentaries and so forth. We'll collate all of those into the show notes so you can get all of that at moonshots.io. Don't forget you can jump on the website and check out all our uh, shows and get the archive and all that good stuff. You can check out some of the live shows we've done. But we also want to just give you a heads up. Our next show will be a very special show. It will be with one of the greatest uh, recent architects, Zaha Hadid. And it's fantastic uh, because it will be our 50th episode. We are going to earn points with our wives because we've got a star female innovator on the show uh, next uh, next show, uh, which, you know, we would love your input. We are always out there looking for recommendations on great female entrepreneurs and innovators. So send us links, lists, recommendations. That would be awesome. Mm-hmm. But 50 shows for the next show, Chad. I mean, oh my gosh. Feels great. Can't wait to uh, blow past 150. And a quick, a quick note is um, we're going to have uh, one more architect after Zaha, that's Bjark Engels, and uh, we'll have a special episode uh, looking back and looking forward. And then, Chad Owen, we won't divest what comes after that. But we have a very, very special set of shows coming up. Uh, shows 53 through 57 are going to knock your socks off, ladies and gentlemen. So stick around for those as well. Chad, I think we're, I think we're there. Is there any uh, last bits we should share with the audience? No. I, I love your call to action to get in the iTunes store and rate the show. That always helps uh, other listeners like yourself discover the show and, and, and others like it. We really appreciate those reviews. Again, if, uh, if we find that you take the time to write us out a, a sentence or, or, or two, we'll give you a shout out and read that review uh, on one of our upcoming episodes. Nice. Nice. And keep up the five-star average, ladies and gentlemen. Come on. We're in it to win it. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, Chad, thank you. What a, what a cool show, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's fun because I get to share these with my wife, who's an architect. Oh, yeah. You are, you're earning serious points uh, there. And tip of the hat to my past uh, grandfather, who I look at Frank Lloyd Wright, and I, and I, can, I can almost see my grandfather, uh, Vic Perry, right there. So this was a special show just for him. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's the Moonshots podcast, and that's a wrap. <laughs>